All right, good morning. Welcome to the start of week 11. So sad, class ends after next Friday. That's it. So six of these things left to go. Um, so we bought like 240 uh, candy canes, and it looks like about 12 of you have candy canes in your hands. So uh, please take those, because I still, frankly, have cupcakes in the office from uh, a few weeks ago. Um, a couple of announcements. So. This Wednesday will be our last super section. We'll hold it around 6.30 p.m. in Science Center E. I'm going to go ahead and lead this one for those of you who would like some additional exposure to Q&A on, review of PHP, MySQL, uh, CSS, XHTML, the whole gamut. Um, I would not wait until after this thing to start problem set 7, but just know that this will be a resource for you. It will be filmed, but realistically, the video might not go up for about 48 hours till Friday. So if you can make it, do come if you want to and you want that review. Quiz 2 is next. Next Wednesday, there's a handout in back. Uh, we'll have sections coming up about that, office hours myself as well. So take a look at that handout. And uh, without further ado, this week is all about uh, building web-based software and in turn cybersecurity, which is sort of the sexy, silly way of describing one's security online. Uh, that is uh, going to be the focus particularly of this coming Wednesday. But what I thought I'd do today is take a look with you at a couple of fun links for both pedagogical and amusing purposes. So uh, one of your classmates actually sent some of these to me. I uh, thought we'd take a look, if nothing else, at the source code of one of these. Um, so there's this great website that's up all year round. It's called Is It Christmas? And if you pull up this website, what you will see is the following. <laughs> Now the neat thing is, a couple neat things. So one, if you right click on most any web page, at least in a PC, and go to view source, you can get the source code, right? So let's actually take a look here for a second. And it turns out that this guy did go ahead and put together uh, XHTML 1.0 transitional, which is the uh, spec that you guys have been adhering to. And uh, you know, it's funny, because the code almost looks more complicated than the page. Here we have a little a body with a t alignment that's centered. Padding top is 200 pixels. And now, actually, this is the funny thing. If you're enough of a geek to know what RSS is, turns out that the guy has an RSS feed. And an RSS feed is like a feed of news articles that he updates every day that you can subscribe to so you can get it delivered to your inbox. And if you get the RSS feed from the past few days, <laughs> it's actually quite clever. So check that out. It's uh, isitchristmas.com. But we've linked to it off the course's website if you'd like to take a look. So this is another one that's pretty simple, too. It uses a technology called Flash, with which you guys, I'm sure, are familiar from uh, YouTube, from the course's videos, and from most any animation that you see online these days. This is called Zombo.com. Welcome to Zombo.com. <laughs> this is Zombo.com. Welcome. This is Zombocom. Welcome to Zombocom. <laughs> you can do anything at Zombocom. Anything at all. Funny thing is, this is all you can do at Zombocom. <laughs> So around like 2 a.m. last night, I was actually uh, you know, practicing for lecture by visiting this website. And the damn thing didn't even loop after uh, at least a good minute or two. So I'd be curious to see if one of you want to sit through that exactly what the, the period is of the thing. Uh, what else do we have here? There are a couple more that we can take a quick glance at. Uh, one of which was called, oh, this is a good one. This is one of these silly internet spams, too, perhaps. Shut down the internet. Someone went ahead and implemented this. I'm not sure what language they implemented in, but if you click this little here button, apparently now it's shut down. So you guys, too, are capable, presumably, of doing that as well now. And finally, a segue to today's discussion will be to look at one of two of the teaching fellows' work. So in preparation for this semester, all of us put together our own PHP-based websites so that we would have the same experience as you guys all would have, much like we did with Scratch many weeks ago. So uh, our own David Ramos went ahead and put together uh, as his PHP-based program a program with which you can rate types of bread. So this is his Top Breads website. Mind you, this is representative of the sorts of things you guys can do, too, with uh, PHP and the like now. Uh, you can submit a new bread, for instance, and complete this form and rate uh, the bread. You can even upload a photo thereof. Looks like thus far Wonder Bread, uh, Irish Soda Bread have been ranked, Rye, uh, and whole wheat. So check that out via the course's website. And Kristen Lovin went ahead and made one, which is um, 
Also similarly based on PHP, Confessions of a Harvard Student, a prototype of a website with which you can uh, semi-anonymously just put it all out there based on what's on your mind, based on what you've been doing. You can just fill out this form under confess. You specify the type of confession you want to make. You fill it out. You click submit. And you've got your own little uh, uh, confessional booth there. Uh, more fun, perhaps, if a bit voyeuristic, is to look at what other people have been saying. Uh, if we click a couple of these, let's see. Uh, pride, that one's apparently blank. OK. <laughs> so mind you, this has been live on our site for a couple of days. Uh, let's try about lust. I have, okay, <laughs> that was, <laughs> I have to edit that out of the video. That was not there last night at 2 a.m. <laughs> um, okay, let's leave it at that. <laughs> um, anyhow, <laughs> we'll have to go look through the uh, IP address logs for that one. <laughs> All right, so anyhow. Um, it seems to be interesting sometimes to try building something from scratch, and so I thought we'd try to improve upon something we did last time and then transition ourselves to problem set seven, the focus of which is this site, CS50 Finance. Uh, so recall last time that we looked at this Frosh IMs example. The purpose in life was simply to create this little form that's representative of a bunch of different types of form inputs you can provide. And the idea here was I wanted a text field, a checkbox, some radio buttons, and a dormitory address. But recall from last time that this thing did in fact submit to a PHP-based program called register.php. But what did that thing do upon receiving our input? Register.php. What did it do? I click Submit. Perfect. So if you did, in fact, submit all the fields, like David is going to be a captain, male, and say Matthews, and click register, you got a message saying you are registered. Not really. But we did actually validate that information, right? We didn't actually save it anywhere or do anything all that interesting with it. But inside of register.php was a bit of error checking, checking whether the request variable, either via get or post, recall that request just means check both get and post variables. If any of those were blank, we we wanted to just bounce the user back to uh, froshims.html to let him or her try again. Well, that's not all that useful if you're, in fact, for your student group, trying to build up a database of registrants or you're trying to actually keep this information around. So let's take that step today and actually put a database around this. So if we want to actually keep around this kind of information, well, we probably want to store it somewhere in the place, as you know, that you'll be storing things for problem set. 7 is specifically in this type of database called MySQL. Uh, it's a specific implementation of a general type of database, which is just a SQL database, SQL database. This is just a very popular one. It's free, it's very high performing, and it's free, which frankly is very compelling for folks vis-a-vis -vis things like Oracle or uh, Microsoft SQL Server, which are some of the commercial versions. So you'll see in problem set seven, if you haven't already, that you can configure your database, manage it, like change the tables, add some fields, look at the data via this uh, pretty nice web-based interface called PHP MyAdmin. It's a coincidence that it's written in PHP. We're using it because it's fairly user friendly, certainly more so than doing everything at the nice.fas prompt with fairly arcane commands. So you'll note for problem set seven that we went ahead and created for all, or all of you guys. Uh, databases, so your own username, password, and your own database so that you could do anything you want with your CS50 finance and actually design the tables yourselves. Well, what I'm going to do is borrow CS50 studs database. I'm going to go ahead and click on the name thereof. And what you'll see on the right-hand pane now, according to PHP MyAdmin, is just a list of all the tables in there. And I'm going to wave my hands at the users table that's there, because that's pre-existing for problem set seven's sake. But I'm going to actually go ahead and create a new table here. And think of these tables, again, as akin to an um, Excel spreadsheet. Right? Intuitively, it seems pretty reasonable. If I'm trying to collect data like this from my users, then I might as well just put each user in like a row of an Excel file, one after another after another. And that's what we're going to mimic, albeit with an actual database, which is more queryable uh, and higher performing than just a file on my desktop. So what do we want to keep around? What, how many columns do I want in this database table? If, 
All right, so I clearly want at least four. So I'm going to go ahead and do exactly that. And actually, just to、uh, preach a good principle here, I'm actually going to say that I want five for this.、Um, I'm going to call this table, let's say,、uh, registrants. Or I'll just frosh IMs for simplicity. And I'm actually going to say five fields for the following reason. Recall in Excel, if you've ever used it, that all the rows are numbered and they're uniquely numbered from one on up to infinity. And that tends to be a useful thing if, when you start developing more complicated software, you want to start referring to. Your data, say your users in multiple different tables, right? If your username, if you have usernames of people like CS50 Stud or Malin, well, that's all fine and good. You can use those usernames to look up data in all of your tables, but Malin is at least five characters to check. Much better is it to give me, Malin, a unique integer, like the number 1, 2, 3, 4, that you can represent with just four bytes, one int, and so forth. So the principle is to use these keys, these numeric keys, just so that each of your users. Has in fact a unique ID underneath the hood. I'm going to call this thing ID, and MySQL,、uh, and specifically MySQL here, gives us a whole bunch of different data types, most of which we don't really need to worry about today, but I'm going to choose an easy one, an int, and I'm going to specify that I want this to be an unsigned int. Just for convention's sake, I want all of my IDs to be、uh, positive or zero. I don't want it to be null, so I'm going to make the database ensure that this value cannot be null no matter what the user tries to insert into this database. And if I keep scrolling here, there's going to be all these radio buttons, which the problem set spec makes mention of. But notice this one here, it has a little key icon. So if I click this circle, that's just telling the database that this ID field is going to be one of those primary keys, which means it has to be unique. But the upside of that is that what databases do, certainly for large data sets like Facebook or The like is they optimize themselves automatically behind the scenes so that lookups on, based on primary keys are very efficient. They don't have to search, for instance, every row. They can do binary search based on that field or something even more clever than that. A lot of research has gone into these kinds of things. All right, so now I want to keep around people's names. A varchar is a string. That can be anywhere between 0 and 255 characters. So I'm going to go ahead and say, all right, 255 is the max. It's var in the sense that it varies. So it's not always 255 characters. It will only use as much space in the database as is necessary.、Uh, the other field I wanted to keep around was what? Captain, gender, and dorm. So dorm is pretty easy. That's a word too. So 255 for that.、Uh, gender, I can probably cut some corners and just specify. Let's say a char, and I'll just store this as M or F for convenience, but you could come up with other ways of doing that, like a zero or a one. I'll go with M or F. And then finally, for captain, intuitively, what kind of data type might we want here? Yeah, so a bool, and you can in fact do that, or you can simulate it in SQL. Um, here we do have, in fact, something that's called a bool, but it actually tends to be represented as just a byte underneath the hood, but you don't need to care about that. So I'm going to go ahead and say that's a bool. I'm going to double check that everything looks OK. a y Can any of these things be、uh, null? I'm going to be pretty picky and require that the user give me everything, but I am going to give a default value. So a captain by default, someone will not be a captain by default, so I'll say that's zero. And then gender, I'm going to leave alone because I don't want to presume anything. And we'll just leave it at that. So I'm going to click Save. Hopefully, I didn't make any mistakes. And now, this, just to be clear why we're having you guys use PHP MyAdmin, you can pick this stuff up eventually. But had we not used this nice GUI, that's the command you would have had to type effectively at the nice.fas prompt. And you very quickly get bogged down in syntax with no enlightening.、Um, Uh, lessons really. But know that that's what was just executed. And now notice in this table here, MySQL,、uh, uh, PHP MyAdmin is showing me what this table looks like. All right, so that's it. I've set up my database table. I know what it's called. It's called Frosh IMs. Now let's actually use it. So I'm going to go back to register.php and I'm going to add a few lines of code here that allow me to actually connect to that database. And just so that I don't see any annoying error messages or warnings. What I'm actually going to do is turn off certain types, or rather, let's say, turn on these kinds of error warnings. But with this command here, and you can just take this、uh, at face value for now, these sequences of commands is just going to make sure that we see particularly bad error messages. 
but not all error messages. We'll just, we'll just get distracting for today's purposes. And now I'm going to go ahead and declare a few variables. So my database details. And I'm going to say my database name was what? CS50 stud, it turns out, much like yours will be your username. All right, my DB username, as you'll see in problem set seven, is also your FAS username, just to keep things simple. And then your DB password is actually a fairly cryptic string. I, again, have very insecurely just pasted it on my desktop and shared it now with the world. I'm going to go back here, though, and paste that in for now. And now I need one other thing, a DB server, which, as you'll see in the spec, is we run our own, uh, mysql.cs50.org, uh, and then 5050. So uh, recall that discussion a couple days ago about TCP. IP, and this is perhaps worth noting. So TCP IP was all about the language that computers on the internet speak. Well, it turns out that even though we talk about a computer as a web server sometimes, or an email server, or a database server, those things can all be running on physically the same box. But if packets are just coming from point A to point B, a server, and some of those packets might be from Internet Explorer, some of those might be coming from a database program, some of those might be coming from someone's email client, Computers need a way of distinguishing what kind of data is coming into them, even though the name of the server might be the same, cs50.org. And so thanks to TCP, one of the partners in that uh, dual language that's used on the internet, you can use unique IDs to specify what kind of service you want that data to be delivered to. And because we're running our own server and we didn't want to conflict with anything else that was running on this box, we arbitrarily decided, this is CS50, we're going to say that the unique number for our database for this problem set is 5050. And in this way, can our server distinguish database traffic from, say, web traffic or email traffic or the like? All right, so those are all the details I need. Now, if I want to connect to server, I simply have to do something like this. Uh, connection is going to get the return value of my SQL connect, DB server is what needs to be passed first. And I know that just by having looked at the documentation. DB user gets passed in next. DB pass gets it passed in after that. And then I need to select my specific database. And to do that, you simply say MySQL select database of connection. And now at this point in the story, with those, what, eight or so lines of code, assuming I didn't make any syntax errors, that's all it takes to tell this PHP program to go connect to that database. And here and after, I can execute those SQL queries, and the data will come not from, say, the local computer or hard drive, but from wherever that database, mysql.cs50.org, happens to live. Well, I still want to go ahead and validate the user's data down here, so I'm going to leave these lines alone. But I'm going to go beyond this if condition, because if I actually get this far and the input is, in fact, legit, now I want to go and insert this into this database. But I want to be careful, because remember, there are some of those security concerns. I don't want to allow someone to just send in the username delete star, which might delete all of my data. Rather, I want to make sure they can't do such. So I'm going to go ahead and prepare my inputs doing something like this. Well, the user's name is not just going to be the result of the get, str uh, the get strings name field. Because again, if they put in a name like delete, that's perhaps dangerous. And so recall that there's this fairly uh, long uh, function called that, whose purpose in life is just to make sure that there's no bad commands nested inside the user's input. And if there is, that will make sure that they don't get executed. They just get ignored or inserted as strings, not as commands. So now I have in my name variable a safer version of name. Now what about captain? Well, we'll come back to that in a second. But let's do dorm, because that's a copy-paste job. So now I have another variable called dorm, which is safely escaped, so to speak. Uh, gender, I'm going to do similarly. So gender is also just going to be the value passed in. And I'm going to escape it, lest it be bad. And the only one I'm going to be a little careful about now is captain, because that's a bool. But it turns out that the, ver the check boxes are submitted if they're checked with the value on, O-N, or if they're not checked, usually with no value. So it's not just a 1, 0 kind of thing. It's an explicit string by convention, usually, O-N, or nothing at all. Uh, so if I want to handle this, I'm actually going to just say something like this. So if the get parameters captain variable is just non-null, right? I'm not going to even bother comparing it because I know if there's something there, it means it was checked. And if there's nothing there, it wasn't. I'm going to go ahead and say that the captain variable will take on the value of 1 
Otherwise, the captain variable will take on a value of 0. And I've just set that to be a string. Now, notice one weird thing here. So those of you, um, you might recall from C that that's equivalent to this in both PHP and C. All right, all I've added is the curly braces. But recall that when you declare a variable inside of curly braces in C, what's the implication? All right, so the scope is limited to those curly braces. So PHP is very sloppy when it comes to the scoping of variables. And so that variable captain, even though that's the very first time I've mentioned it, it actually will continue to exist throughout the remainder of the file, which is convenient because now you don't have to bother thinking in advance about what all your variables are going to be. But it's potentially dangerous or confusing, and it's certainly lazy because now there's less of a clear definition of in what context variables are defined. So, so be it. We now know that Captain exists, and now all it remains to do is to prepare my query. All right. So we've been talking a lot, but at the end of the day, all I did was connect to the database and just make sure my inputs are safe. All right, so step three is to create the SQL query. I'm going to arbitrarily call that SQL in a variable name. And then a neat trick for preparing queries that you want to plug user data into, you can do this in a whole bunch of ways. Actually, we'll start with the simpler one. Ultimately, I'm going to want to insert into my database. And the SQL command for insert is insert. The table name is called frosh ims. And then the fields I want to input are name, followed by captain, followed by gender, followed by dorm. And then I want to insert certain values. And here's where things get a little sloppy. So I can close this quote now, or rather, the name I want to put in needs to be uh, quoted. So if the user typed in Joe, what I effectively want to pass in, let me make this fit on one line, is quote unquote Joe. Usually in single quotes, if I'm using double quotes to sandwich everything on the outside. All right, but I don't want just Joe, though. I want whatever the user typed, which is in what variable? OK, so I can go ahead and do name. Uh, if I go ahead and do name, then I can just start typing in like this. Or I can actually use something that keeps things maybe a little cleaner, namely sprintf, which you've seen before and we use throughout a number of our examples. And this is going to get a little long, so I'm going to uh, butcher it for just a second. I want to put a string followed by another string, followed by another string, followed by another string. And what are the, uh, the subsequent arguments to sprintf. Yeah, so name, and then uh, what? Captain, and then gender, and then dorm. So that's yet another way. But and realize, too, and you'll see in the spec that there's yet a third way of approaching this. You can use PHP's concatenation operator, which is to say, if you want to start adding strings to the ends of other strings, like let's paste this variable onto the end, then this one, then this one, you can use just a period, a dot, which is the concatenation operator. So all those hoops you guys have been jumping through to copy strings into buffers and making the buffer grow to fit the string. That's all gone now. Like strings are dynamically sized. Wow, someone actually smiled. So strings are dynamically sized, whereby you don't have to know a priori how big your string is going to be. Just concatenate away, and PHP will figure out how to find space for it. And that's a wonderful thing. Java has this feature as well. Um, you can do it with uh, C as well, but not C. All right, so assuming that's actually correct, I'm going to go ahead and save this thing right after we execute this query. So execute the query. And to do that, you call MySQL query of the SQL statement. And that's it. So a few steps. Well, we talked for a while, but again, grab, um, connect to the database, check that the data is not dangerous, prepare the query, execute the query. And those last two are sort of one and the same. So three steps to getting that data into the database. Yeah. Oh, uh, crap, but I hadn't closed my quote string at that point. So I just started hitting Enter just to make it fit. That's all I meant. I could have, yeah. Yep, in the back. Ah, good question. So why do I need to use uh, MySQL real escape string on, for instance, the bubble whose value I should know? Well, I, should, I know that a checkbox is passed in, for instance, as ON only by convention. But it's entirely up to IE and Firefox and Safari to adhere to that kind of convention. A malicious user could himself send a query or create a web page that doesn't submit ON or nothing, but actually submits, quote unquote, delete just to be 
malicious. So the safest assumption whenever you're doing server-side development is just don't trust the user. Yeah? And also, it might come to someone taking over security then, but mm -hmm. it seems like it's a pretty bad way to have the password as you know, share all the security So an excellent point. So there, you guys are all staring at my password, if not using my password at this very moment. So this seems <laughs> a bad thing. But it's not so much, at least in this context. So recall, let's see, did we say as much? So I said under my breath the other day when I was fighting with one of those bugs that uh, PHP's on FAS run set UID. So that technical jargon just means that, um, and you'll see this in problem set seven, that PHP files don't only need to be readable, writable, and executable by you, their owner, not the whole world. Even though conceptually the PHP is meant to be used by the whole world. What this means is that when you request a PHP file with a browser, yes, it belongs to you, but FAS realizes, oh, this is a PHP file. I'm going to execute this PHP. I'm going to interpret it, but using Malin's username or using CS50 Stud's username. The implication of which is I don't need to let anyone else view it. But the catch is that if I, the programmer, screw up using Malin's account or CS50 Stud's account or even worse, CS50's account, and I have a bug in my code that, for instance, lets one of you inject arbitrary code, similar in spirit to what Mike Smith talked about, similar to what we've discussed briefly with SQL injection attacks, one of you guys, just by visiting CS50's web page, could, for instance, delete our entire database. Because we screwed up. Because you, even though we wrote the code that you're executing, it's being executed technically as us under our username. So there are different ways of handling this. This is one way where you put the onus on the programmer to make sure he or she doesn't screw up. Or there's other ways of um, sandboxing your code so that it runs as literally a username called nobody. And that's pretty common on other systems as well. So an interesting aside. But long story short, this database, yes, is viewable to me, the owner, but no one else on FAS could look at this file. No, so that's actually an excellent point to make. Recall that when you actually pull up a PHP-based web page in a browser like this one, which I think will not yet, oh, well, what do you know? We didn't break it yet. If you view source, all you're going to see is the XHTML that was generated, nothing that's between the open bracket uh, question marks, unless your machine is misconfigured. All right, now just to be safe here, I'm going to go back in here. And I'm going to go into seven, uh, 755 for us IMs. I'm going to go into this other directory just to save time. And this is the same form that we've been looking at. It's about to submit to a form much like the one we submitted. So I'm going to go ahead and say David. It's going to be a captain, male, and he'll be in Matthews. Click register. And now it's said again, you are registered really, but now let's take a look at our database. So I just pulled back over to PHP My Admin, and one of these tabs up top, which are like the menu options for this thing, is a Browse tab. And if I click Browse, notice, voila, Malin, in fact, is now in this database. And if I go ahead and submit this yet again, just to prove to you that was not a canned demo, let's call it Mike. Uh, he'll be in Apple register. Let's go back to my database, click Browse again so it refreshes. <laughs> Damn it. OK. <laughs> I should have left it alone, shouldn't I? Uh, what just happened here? You know, I got greedy. OK. Uh, for Ashley Ams 2, that's correct. Uh, it submits to Ashley Ams 1, it gets submitted to Ashley Ams 2. Yeah, I thought I did by clicking Browse here. All right, well, well, hmm? Oh, is that maybe it? Let's take a look. Did I not turn that on before? All right, so let's see if I can save myself here. Extra, auto increment, save. If that is, in fact, what I needed to do, I will explain what I just did. Otherwise, we will uh, brush this under the rug. I'm going to go ahead and try to register Mike again. Go back to the database, click Browse. Nicely done. <laughs> OK. So um, it turns out what I forgot to do earlier 
is when you're creating your database table, especially when you're trying to create these primary keys, notice what I'm going to do here actually is gonna, I'm going to go edit my whole database again. And it shows me those same fields as before. And what you are sharp, quite sharp enough to notice is that I forgot to turn on this auto increment feature. So because I specified that I need a primary key, which means that row must be unique, but I wasn't telling the database itself to go figure out what number to use for the next registrant, what I was trying to do effectively was insert the same ID twice because I didn't specify it explicitly. So it was trying to give both David and Mike ID of zero. ID of zero. And the database is going to prevent that because of this notion of primary keys by turning on auto increment, which we've actually done in your own users table for problem set seven. All of that gets taken care of for you. So thank you for saving me there, at least to some extent. You all saw that I screwed up. All right. So what else can we do with this? Well, here's an interesting idea, and it's pretty compelling from like a student group perspective. It's all fine and good to put something in a database, especially if you're running model UN or something where there's a good amount of data where you don't want to just um, um, it, you don't want to just use paper pencil. But suppose that you'd like to have some kind of feedback mechanism now whereby you, the programmer, say get emailed anytime someone registers for your site. Or maybe even they get emailed the confirmation. Well, I have no idea how to do this in PHP. I just learned this thing last week. So where do you how do you go about implementing this stuff? Well, again, just to emphasize a point here, if you're not sure how to accomplish some task, say in PHP, well, what about PHP mail? And you'll notice that, well, it looks like someone just learned this a few minutes ago. If I click this link, W3Schools, this is one of the tutorials we've been preaching. Having a program send an email in PHP, which I know is something some of you guys have wondered just how easy it is for your final projects. See that little code in the middle of the page where we declare a to line, a subject line, a message, a from, some headers, and then call a mail function? Bam. Done. So let's take a look. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and, like a good learning student, copy paste that. I'm going to go over to uh, my Frosh IMs example, which is this same file here. All that data is the same. And this is the version you have a printout of, just so that I was careful, uh, made sure I got all of the syntax and comments right. At the very end of my program now, before I thank the user and tell him or her that they've been registered, I'm going to go ahead and send an email. So let me just go ahead and clean this up. I'm going to indent all this. We won't spend, uh, we won't care too much about the specifics of this thing, but I just want to go ahead and get an email. Well, before class, I signed us up for a CS50 stud at Gmail account, and that's where I want these confirmations to go. Uh, someone registered will be the subject line of these emails. Uh, the message is going to be, uh, let's say, not just someone registered, but rather, Let's put in parentheses the name of the person using that concatenation operator, which is just a period. The name of that person, recall, is stored in the get string name. And then I'm just going to put another parenthesis, registered. Semicolon. So now I have a dynamically generated string that puts parenthetically the person's name who registered, but I'm not going to bother confirming the other details for now. Uh, the from line, I'm actually just going to send it from myself because it doesn't really matter. I'm just using this as a hint. I'm going to leave the headers alone, the mail call alone. I'm not going to bother echoing anything because I don't want the user to know that I've been emailed. And I'm just going to let the user see the web page as before. So if I did everything correctly this time, let's go back to the Frosh IMs page, which is here. Let's go ahead and run, uh, register Jill as a captain, a female, say in Canada. Click register. Okay, good. No bugs apparently in that version of the file. Let's go over to Gmail, CS50 stud. Uh, this password's not the same, so I'm going to go ahead and type that one in. And let's see. Hey, someone registered. Look at that. So I'm going to go ahead and click that, and it looks like indeed Jill did register. It also seems that Gmail is different. So um, it's as easy as that. And that hopefully is a very compelling example of just how much exists in the way of libraries out there with PHP specifically that just makes your life as a programmer so much easier than you guys experienced for nine weeks plus in this course with, say, C. Yeah? What if the query is not added to the database? So to be sure, I am definitely cutting corners with this demonstration. If something goes wrong, 
I don't know about it, the user doesn't know about it, and so clearly that's not perfect code. So my emphasis for today is really just on this functionality, not on the requisite error checking that, for instance, you'll see in our own source code for problem set seven, where we were very careful to try to handle all possible error conditions. But absolutely, I should really be going in here and checking the return values of some of these functions, specifically MySQL query, so that I can actually provide the user with some kind of error mechanism. And how do I know what these things should return? Well, again, the the best website to consult for authoritative information is that site php.net, which we cite constantly in problem set 7 spec because it's a wonderful manual and gives you not only examples of how to use various functions, you also, I mean, computer people have a lot of free time. They have little uh, discussion threads associated with each of the functions so that people can talk about how they've used these functions, how they've improved upon these functions. And silly as that may sound, it's actually pretty useful because people talk about some fairly esoteric issues that are useful, um, at least for increasingly experienced programmers, to hear about. So, any questions about the Frosh IMs example we whipped up? Yeah. Great question. No, uh, PHP has the kitchen sink and more, including all of these MySQL related functions because the two are so commonly intertwined. To, um, granted, if you use a very old version of PHP, we're using version 5, which is the latest, you might not have all that kind of functionality. But for the most part, uh, nothing I think I've done in lecture actually uses a library per se that doesn't come with PHP. Oh, did I not? Let's take a look. So in register.php db, uh, oh, did I goof? Wait, I think I needed it in, yep, it was supposed to be in this line. My bad. This is why I sometimes fake demos and you run the code I wrote in advance in case I do screw up. OK, good catch, though. Other questions? All right, so who cares? What can you do with this stuff? Well, so. I had this vision early on in the semester that it would be cool once we got to this PHP part of the course's syllabus to have the last problem set be this stock portfolio management tool. And frankly, at the time, I had no idea how we were going to do this. I wasn't sure what kind of data existed for free. I mean, there's Bloomberg, and there's MSN, and Yahoo, and all of these. Actually, Bloomberg, then there's all these free sites like Yahoo, and MSN, and Google. But for the most part, all of these sites are just um, HTML based. And I actually had fears of having to write programs that would grab this web page with some PHP code, screen scrape it, so to speak, which means to search all of the XHTML for the fields we actually wanted, and then hand that data back to you. But it turns out that, thanks again, frankly, to a bit of Googling and asking questions like uh, uh, computer readable stock data or free stock quotes and things like this. It took me an hour or so to find this. I finally found some guy's post on some bulletin board that mentioned that what he does is he actually downloads these Excel files that uh, Yahoo makes available. So an Excel is a bit of an abuse of the term. But if I click this download data link for Google here, what you'll notice is that it indeed tries to open up a file ending in .csv, which stands for comma separated variables, which is just a really quick and dirty version of a spreadsheet. If I go ahead and open this, though, what you will see is a one row database tape, uh, one row spreadsheet table that simply has Google symbol, then some pricing, uh, the last day and time at which the price was modified, the days change, and so forth and a few other details. Now, that is a lot more compelling to a computer scientist or a programmer than dealing with something like that. Because if we go ahead and view source of this page, I mean, you can imagine the headache that it might be to actually write a program that figures out all of this stuff and reliably grabs the fields that you want. So this was great. I realized that we can do just what this guy did and write a function that grabs this data. And in fact, that's precisely what you have at your disposal with problem set 7. So the spec will walk you through most all of these files, but just note how relatively easy it is in PHP to grab data like that. So the function in question is our lookup function. This lookup function, we decided, would take a stock ticker symbol, case insensitively. And what it's going to do is pretend effectively to be a web browser. And it's going to pretend to go, or it's going to go fetch that download data link from Yahoo's website running on people.fast, but pretending to be a web browser, just using this HTTP protocol. And I'm using, actually, in PHP, just fopen. 
So it turns out that f open in PHP, not in C, can also accept URLs. And you can pass it a URL. What URL am I passing it? Well, it looks like I'm passing Yahoo dot, which is concatenation, the symbol. Well, what's Yahoo? Well, it turns out, as you'll see in the spec, that's just a constant, which is this thing. I copied and pasted the beginning of that URL, and there's a bit more off to the screen. But the last thing it says is s equals, and I'll make this fit on one line, s equals blank. And so effectively, what our function does is it just pastes in the value of symbol right after that equal sign. And then it turns out PHP also has this fgetCSV function whose purpose in life is to just get one row after another from exactly that kind of file so that even you don't have to deal with all of the commas or any of the quotation marks that might be in the file. It just hands you back an array. And inside of that array, as you'll see, is a whole bunch of data. And because it's an array, I'm going to access it via 0 and 1 and 2 and 3. But I looked carefully at the data so I know what each of these fields mean. And so what we've created for you is this stock structure, which is very similar in spirit to a C struct. It looks like this. In the context of PHP, it's called a class, like you might call it in C++ and Java. For our purposes, we're just using it as a container for a bunch of data. And among the data that we're going to be handing your CS50 finance program is the stock's name, is the stock's current price, is the time at which the stock last uh, bought or sold, the change for the day, the opening price, the closing price, and even an array of current news articles from the day's newspaper listings from around the world. If this company was mentioned in some news article, odds are it will be in that array, at least in some reputable source. And so we hand that back to you ultimately for you to implement, some of which if you see fit, some of which you must, into your own instance of CS50 Finance. So what does that all look like? Well, we've seen many sneak previews of this thing thus far. I'm going to go ahead and open up CS50 Studs version, which is in CS50 PS7 for him. And what you'll see is the home page here. We've pre-populated your users table with a bunch of accounts. In fact, if I go back to PHP MyAdmin, which is at CS50's website, and then in the MySQL directory, PHP MyAdmin, and I go ahead and log in again as CS50 stud using the password you, at least one of you, has probably written down. Go ahead and click Go. I'm back in the same interface. I'm going to ignore Frosh AMs. That was our last story. Let's click Users. Here's a table described in the spec that has a user ID, a username, and password. And if I click Browse, these are the three freebies we've given you. So it looks like Lord Dark Helmet's in there, George Costanza's in there, and Michael Scott, all of which are pop culture references. So if you watch those shows, hopefully you know why Bosco is George Costanza's password. All right, see, this is, what, this is how you make writing problem sets fun, frankly. All right. so. What is going on then behind the scenes? Well, if we go to CS50 Finance and log in as Lord Dark Helmet with password 12345 and log in, unfortunately, you'll reach this because we stopped short of implementing anything beyond this point. But you're going to need to implement the functionality with which users can check stocks' prices, with which users can, get, uh, can buy shares of stock, with which users can sell shares of stock, and then ultimately see the value of their portfolio. And as promised, a fun spin that we've tried to put on this is to post not a big board, but a bigger board that updates itself, I think, every 30 or 60 seconds at the moment, which everyone's net worth. Because what you'll do if you visit CS50 Finance starting at 11 AM today and go to the appropriate link that you'll We'll link off the appropriate place. Let me actually log out and go back there for a second. So if you go to CS50 Finance, um, the URL for which is in the problem set spec, you will be able to not only run test, um, not only create dummy accounts with which you can play around, but if you click the appropriate link to play the bigger board, will automatically give you and your Harvard ID number 10,000 virtual dollars with which you can now start playing the bigger board. Notice that because I just registered, if I go back to CS50's website here and pull up just the home page, because of our super fancy Ajax technology <laughs> and super fancy bug, um, <laughs> David Malin is currently ranked twice with uh, his current portfolio. So let's go ahead and at least show one thing here. I'll delete that second account, which for some reason got created. Oh, it's because I logged in with my email address instead of my ID number. That's all. It's not a bug. It's a feature. I'm going to go ahead. <laughs> 
I'm going to go ahead and、uh, let's get a quote. So, in the problem set, there's this penny stock. So, I literally went through my spam folder the night I was writing the problem set spec and I figured which stock、uh, spam shall we give them? And we chose one for Infinix Ventures.、Uh, and it's kind of sad that we're picking on these guys. I'm sure it's not fun to get spam about your own stock because it's doing so poorly. But if I go ahead and with our staff implementation of the code, which does, is fully functional, we'll get a price quote. Wow, it was 23 cents before. Class, I really、uh, should have bought it,、uh, done, uh, shorted the stock. But let's go ahead and buy it. So that's 20 cents a share. I've got $10,000. So let's just do 10,000 oh, oh, oh,、uh, divided by 0.20. We can do this math in our heads, I'm sure. That's 50,000 shares of this stock. You know, just an hour ago, I could only buy 46,000 shares, I believe. So 50. Thousand, assuming our math is right and the price hasn't changed just yet because it does grab live feeds. Look at that. So I now am the proud owner of 50,000 shares of this penny stock、uh, against which you can compete on this bigger board. My net worth is still the same, and if we've chosen the right guy here, it's probably this guy, and you click the person's name. Which you guys will be able to see, especially if you want to take the、uh, price is right strategy and just invest like the other guy is investing.、Uh, you can see the value of my portfolio and then also my history and any of your histories. So if you choose to put your name up there, all of this will be kept track of for you. This is not, these are not features your own implementation of CS50 Finance needs. We thought this, though, would be a fun context in which to spin this particular program. So what we will do on Wednesday is focus on threats to your security. We will see you then.